Hi guys, welcome to another Learning Electronics Repair video. Do you remember these? Or remember this, I should say. So this is the PCB of the Air Hockey Arcade Machine. And it's not working, so although I replaced this regulator, which appeared to be okay, I replaced the back capacitor, it doesn't work. So I actually went out and had a look. Now, I have some more PCBs here. He has two more as well. So he has five in total. And one of them works. This one works. This one, he said, was working. But when I went out, it wasn't working. The same as this one. So what's happening with these? It's not as was described that the LEDs light up dim. And nothing else happens. It's that the... the LED, which is like the, how many goals have been scored, those displays, they're supposed to reset to zero, zero. And on these, they're not resetting, they're just giving some fairly random numbers or not even proper digits. So it's like the microcontroller is not talking to them properly. And it seems kind of random. So what I tried doing is I took out the EEPROM powered the board up without the EEPROM in, and the display says zero, zero on one side. I think it said something else on the other side. It should be zero, zero on the other end of the table, basically. Fitted it back in, and you had, like, random half-Chinese characters. Yeah, that sort of thing. So, it appears to be something like the processor's not running or it's crashed or something like that. So, I have the three. Now, when I looked at these before, if you did see the video... This one has this modification. So these two chips are motor drivers, and this has been modified to drive the motors both from the same chip. This one doesn't have that modification, okay? But still doesn't work in the same way. This one, again, doesn't have that modification, but this one does work. There's a few slight differences in the settings on the switches. But I don't really think that's the cause of the problem. This one, which does work, he said that at random it was giving free games, but now it's not. It's working correctly. So I have a few thoughts about this. The one that's giving free games is quite possibly that is an option set on the switches somewhere. I don't have an instruction manual to these to know how the switches should be set. But... It's possible, because the fault is intermittent, there may be dirty contacts in these switches, so it's not giving a proper Logic 1 or Logic 0 might explain why it was sometimes giving free games. Another thing I noticed with this one, so let's put some numbers on these so we know what we, are, we have. So this is, we'll put O, oh, this is the original one I looked at, yeah. This one is bad, and this one is good. Uh, o, B, and G. We've got some numbers, so at least we remember which one is which now. On the original one, one of the things that I noted and we said in the video is, is this voltage regulator was giving 5.6 volts rather than 5 volts. It's a 7805 positive voltage regulator. So you would expect to get 5 volts from it, it's getting 5.06. After I made the video and before I sent it back, I actually changed the regulator and the new one is still giving 5.6. So I want to have a look to see if the other boards have 5.6 on these regulators. Somebody said that it's possible this gives 5.6 because it has a diode from the ground pin to ground. Now I'll just explain what they meant by that. And then that's something we can check for as well because there is another diode down here and I'm not sure if exactly how it's wired up so let's just explain for the new guys on here what i'm talking about this diode and then we can have a look this is something you should know about voltage regulators fixed voltage regulators like these so they have three pins on them okay we have an in we have an out and we have a ground Okay, And the idea of the voltage regulator is, regardless of the input voltage, it gives a fixed output voltage. So if we have a 7805, if we feed a voltage in here, 
which is more than 5 volts, which you get 5 volts out. And there's a kind of a limit, so it may be this has to be 7 volts or more. Yeah, if it gets too low, too close to 5, it can't regulate, okay? That's a fairly simple device. There's capacitors as well on the input, and generally on the output as well. You know, that's how the circuit actually is, okay? Now, the output is basically, in this case, 5 volts more than ground, yeah? That's what it's supposed to do. So what you can do with a regulator is this. Say you wanted a 5.6 volt regulator, yeah, for whatever reason. So we can feed our voltage in, anything more than 7. Let's put 9 in here, okay? What you can do is you can connect the ground pin to ground via a diode for example yeah now what's the voltage on the ground pin well it's no longer zero volts which is ground because it's connected via a diode and if you know a little bit about diodes when they conduct in the one direction the direction of the arrow and the symbol positive to negative, they have a voltage drop. And you can see this on your multimeter. So in diode mode, you'll read 0.59 or 0.6 or 0.55 or whatever you read. That's the voltage drop across the semiconductor junction. So if we put our diode here, obviously it's conducting in that direction. This end has 0 volts. So this end will be, let's say, 0 0.6 volts. It'll be 0.6 of a volt higher. This is the voltage drop you can see. As I say, across a semiconductor junction and diode test mode. The output will be 5 volts more than whatever's on this pin. So the output now will be 5.6 volts. Uh, hope you can see that. You can do other similar things. I'll just mention it while I'm talking about it. For example, if you wanted a... 7 volts, let's say you wanted a 9 volt regulator and you didn't have one for some reason, although they do make a 7809. Okay, if you want to have 9 volts out, what you can do is this. From the input, resistor, got to draw it right, 0 diode. Yeah, and the Zener diode will start to conduct at whatever voltage the Zener voltage is. So if we put here a four volt Zener, yeah, this end will be naught volts ground. Here now we'll have four volts, and the output will be five volts more than whatever's on this pin. Nine volts. Okay, so you can do those sort of things with fixed voltage regulators. There's other things as well. I'll make a video about them, but you can do that sort of thing. So it's possible. And our circuit, this is supposed to be 5.6 for whatever reason, and they've got a diode from the center pin to ground. Yeah, the center pin being the naught volts. One, two, three. That's the pin numbers. So let's check. Let's have a look. Here's the voltage regulator this is the one that we've been getting a bit hot i changed it anyway center pin here and let's compare that to ground we know on these because we had a look before ground is here does it connect to ground not directly no it doesn't okay let's go to diode mode Meters working. Does it go to ground via a diode? Yeah, it does. So that's why we've got 5.6 volts coming out of our regulator, because the ground pin of the regulator is not connecting directly to ground. It's connecting via a diode in the way I just described. So that is supposed to be a 5.6 volt regulator, yeah. Another thing that one of the subscribers, Mr. Guru, mentioned, was that a very common failure on this sort of equipment, he does a lot of arcade machine repair, is just dirty pins on the EEPROM. So while I was on site, I actually did what he suggested with this one at least, which is to clean the legs on the EEPROM. 
So we'll just take that again. I mean, they looked okay. I used a bit of very fine, not sandpaper, emery paper, emery stuff, yeah, whatever they call it. Like that grey looking sandpaper stuff. So I actually give them a clean with that. I'll just show you. But I think you can see straight away they look clean. Yeah, those are the pins. So I've cleaned them, at least on the outside edge anyway. The inside edge could probably do with a bit of a clean, but I cleaned the outside edge of them. So they should be making a good contact into the socket, to be honest. I can give the sockets a bit of a clean with a bit of ISO as well. I'll just see if I find something just to clean the other side of the pins. I don't have the proper stuff here, but I think I can probably use this. This is just a, a wheel off a Dremel. So I think we'll just lay this onto the desk yeah just gently rub it across not much pressure on it might be slightly too abrasive but yeah that's got those nice and clean other side you can see them dirty okay fairly clean so we can try that but I had done this on site it didn't make any difference at least by cleaning the outside edge of the legs but they're relatively clean I think they're pretty good now so we can put this back in and now let's try something the basic problem with this then seems to be that the processor is crashing yeah and I'm thinking the most likely cause is a problem with the EEPROM, maybe a corrupted EEPROM. Now, because I have a good one, we can, or should be able to, I say can, we should be able to, read the contents from the EEPROMs and compare them with the good one and see whether we have corrupted EEPROMs. The EEPROM, I guess, is probably a 2.7 series, like 2.7 something or other. I'm going to have to remove this sticker to do it. I don't know if this is actually an EE prompt, electrically erasable, or whether it's like the type that has a little window inside them that you shine UV light on to erase them. I think it probably doesn't have the window, but this is like metalised on here, so maybe it actually does. And this is to stop any light getting into it. I can't see it any other way to do it other than to take this off to see what they are. 27C64, 128, something like that maybe. So it's peeling off. Yeah, it's peeling off easily. It doesn't have a little window in it. And there's the part number, 2560P. Yeah, you can see C134. I hope that is a part number I can actually look up. We'll have to see. The other idea is that we find a data sheet and then we can see which pins for example is the chip select the date of the address and maybe possibly we can see whether or not the processor is actually running is it trying to read the EEPROM is it trying to operate yes it tries to run the program in the EEPROM that's another idea now these PIC chips will also be programmed devices and this will have software in as well I should say firmware in as well and I believe these are kind of protected against being read so hopefully we don't have to get as far as thinking we've got 40 or 240 chips the guy has two more boards by the way the same one has the Spanish EEPROM same as this the other one has USA it says the other two these relays have been removed and they've kind of lashed on some other relays that wouldn't physically fit using wires they kind of like dangling off over here I mean I would have at least glued onto the edge of this or something there was two more as well but apparently neither of those work either okay let's see if we can find any data on this chip these EEPROM chips I couldn't find a data sheet, so the number on them says 2560P. Uh, and then there's like some date code. If you look at another one, I'll just show you. That's also 2560P and has different codes here, but I'm pretty sure that is the actual part number. The logo is like ISD, but it looks like something like that. But I can't find any information on these at all at the moment. So I've asked somebody I know, who hopefully will know that, 
So I thought in the meantime, I'd have a look around the EPROMs to see if I can see any difference in diode mode on the various bins. And comparing the good one with one of the bad ones, mostly the pins read the same. So if we get onto ground here, we just go onto pin one. You can see 817, similar. Similar, three, three similar, four similar, five similar, six, seven, eight, and then we read something different on the ninth. Yeah, and this is the uh, good one, so we can just compare. You can see we have basically the same. Oh, but that reads different on that pin, yes, yeah? so that's a seven, six, one, and on the bad one. It's reading different, so we have a difference there, yeah, we have a difference there. I mean, if we could get at the good one, pin three, see, so yeah, that's different, yeah. So we have quite a lot of readings on here, which look like a diode junction, yeah, on the good one. We've got the bad one. We don't have, okay? So there's definitely some difference there. That's the bad one, not the one that I looked at, yeah? So I've got the other bad one. So this is the original one I looked at, which was bad. How does that compare on these EPROMs? So let's see. So this one was reading 8 something. Yeah, well, 7, 8 is slightly different. Seven eighty. So that one's much higher, sixteen hundred. Yeah. So there's definitely quite a few differences I can see reading around these EEPROM chips. Seven eighty. Sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred. Seven eighty. So you can see around those and get on the working one for comparison. I got a connection. Yeah. So something reads different. So is it the EEPROM that's reading different, or is it something that's connected to it? Well, the easiest way to figure that out is to take the EEPROM chips out. So let's take these chips off here. Yep, yeah, it's out. Okay, yeah, it didn't, it bent the ends on slightly, but I can uh, soon straighten those up and get it back in again. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll do the same with the original one. Now let's read on the actual socket. So this is to determine whether the EEPROM is reading different or something that's connected to it's reading different. Okay. I better mark them, hadn't I? So this is the good one. Find something that will write on it. Always do this sort of things, guys. Don't think you'll just know which is which, because you won't just know which is which. You can, I can guarantee it. Yeah. That's the good one. Right. What have we got on these sockets? So ground, 782, 784, uh, 16, 78. So we'll just do the first few, 16, 78. How does that compare to this one? Eight one eight. Ah, so there's something, there's something Different on this board, yeah. Something different on this board, the working one. Let's have a look at the other bad one as well. This one we'll call it B because it says B on the board. Okay, that's a B, sort of. 
<laughs> Something like a bee. I just really. Just get into this, this end of it a little bit so I can just weave this out without bending the pins. Yeah. Okay, that's that one. Let's have a look at this one, Reeds. This is different like the other one, yeah? So the difference in readings appears to be something on the board. So we need to good one again. Yeah. So we're not cracking up. So what we need to do is to have a look to see where they're going to be. It looks like they might go to this chip here. I mean, they look like they come off over here to me. Tracks are going this way, it's on the other side of the board. Nothing so obvious that side, but this side we've definitely got tracks going to this chip and possibly to these as well. So let's have a look. So we'll go from the second one up. We know this is one that reads like a, a diode junction. Where's it go? It goes there. Yeah. Probably just goes to one. Right, that's a diode junction. That's a good thing about this meter. It gives a long continuous bleep when you have a continuity. And a short bleep when you have a diode junction. That's why I use it for short finding. Yeah. Oh. No, it's just a diode junction. Oh, what we got? Ah, oh. goes here as well. Somewhere here. Yeah, there. So they go into these chips. Let's just try the third one. Where's that go to? Yeah, it goes to here. Somewhere. I'm sure I had it somewhere. Certainly went to here. There, yeah, it goes there definitely. I think it went to here as well. But basically, yeah, somewhere I had something. <laughs> I'm obviously just getting past it. We do for definite to go to these chips anyway without me tracing any more. That's a good one. Okay, this is the original one. What's this one doing? So, second pin up was one of them. That went here somewhere. Yeah, and somewhere here. There, yeah. Third one, that's somewhere here. Or was it somewhere here? Well, that's interesting. Hmm, so we can get on the good. Third one. Here's the fourth pin down there, yeah. Look on this one, yeah. Second one. Third one, sorry. I've got a good one here. Third one up. Diode junction. Goes there. Yeah, third one up goes there. Fourth pin down. Bad one again. Third one up. Yeah, 
doesn't go here. Uh, these boards the same revision. Well, they have the same number on them, so yeah, there's the same division or that. So, what well, have got a difference there? That's interesting. So, again, second pin. Third one down there. Yeah. Second pin. Third one down there. Third pin. Yeah, I have a connection there. So it looks like we got some problem with some of the tracks on here as well. I'll have a closer look see if I can spot where that is. I'm going to clean this up. If you look at these tracks on this, they're all quite grubby, possibly corroded. This one is nice and clean in comparison. Yeah, so. I'm going to wash that board. So I've looked at our bad one. Pin three. This looks quite well. Better than the other one, yeah. Better than the other one. I'm going to wash this one as well. Pin three is actually going on here. Yeah, you can hear it. Yeah, continuous play. So there's problems with the tracks on this one, quite clearly. Um, these two boards are very dirty, so I'm going to put them in the sink, let them have a good dry, and then let's see if we can be more conclusive where the problem is. I've let the boards dry overnight, so it's a different day today. Different t-shirt, yeah. Uh, so, um... It looks clean in there, but there's definitely some sort of corrosion in it here. And we know for certain that there are some pins which are not connected, like some sort of track problem on this. I have a few ideas how to go about it then. What I'm going to do first, I'm going to do this in a much more methodical method than I was just trying, because I was kind of like all over the place, really. I'm going to measure from each pin on the EEPROM, so there's 28 pins, starting from here, pin 1. I'm going to go around the EEPROM pins and see where they go. So, for example, we can see they go, we can, well, his, see and here, yeah, we can see and here, they go to multiple places. So, for example, this, which is pin one, goes, you can hear it, yeah, you can see it goes to this chip, this chip, this chip, this chip, this one, and this one, yeah. And we also seem to have this little chip here, the AND gate, which is somehow connected to the EEPROM. Yeah. Although it didn't pin out to that pin, but it is. We can see where the wire is going to go under here. So I'm going to measure to each of those chips to make sure I do this in an organised manner. I have my book, so you can see pins 1 to 28, which is the EEPROM. Pins down there, yeah. Uh, and then these ICs, IC5 is that one, and then the other ones, IC numbers of each of these in turn, and that one. So I'm going to track through to every chip from every pin and build up a table of connections here. I'm doing this on the good one, and as I measure from each pin, I'm doing the same on the bad one to look for any differences. So any differences we can circle, and then when we've completed the chart to the bottom, we'll have like a map of how this is connected together. If I find any broken connections, I will fix them with uh, probably a little thin bit of wire, actually, just rather than trying to repair the trace, I'll just connect the points that should be connected. And then let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, 
I've tried already reading these EPROMs. I don't know what they are. I asked somebody. He didn't know either. So I'm asking you guys now. This chip, 2560P. He thought it might be a 27256. I haven't tried to read the good one because I don't want to damage it. But the two bad ones, I've read them. Selecting... Uh, 27256 because I mean 2560 he thought might be 27256 or 27C256 or H256. I've tried a number of different ones. The ID it's reading from the EPROM doesn't match, but I read basically like every location is F1, or in some cases, like first so many rows are F9 and all the rest are E8. So either both of these are corrupt and they don't read the same either. That's the interesting thing, they don't actually read the same even though it's reading garbage from what I can see. I'm a bit loath to put this in the EEPROM program because it's the only good one I have. But I'll try further, you know, I'll see if I can get any more advice on how to read those EEPROMs. The other thing I could try, if I've repaired the various traps, it doesn't work, is to replace all these latches because there's a latching data between here and here replace the and gate as well because these will be cheap these will be cheap to replace and i spoke to the guy these boards are quite valuable and they're expensive to replace so i don't mind doing that sort of work and then maybe we'll get somewhere with these we know the voltage rails are okay um, another thing we can do i haven't done yet but we can measure to ground and diode mode from every pin on the pit chip and compare it with the other one that might be also a useful thing to do okay so i'll spend some time building that table of connection pins up and then let's see what we can find it took me a couple of hours really to go through all three boards but i have now this and this is proving really, really useful. So, it's a map, as I said, from the uh, CPU, which is IC5, IC11, 15, 9, 8, and 10. And 14, there's a little one on the end here. And now I know which pins go where. So, all the numbers you see here are measured on the good board, the working board. And the ones where they say NC, this is no connection, and this is on... The original one that I looked at. So from pin 8 on the EEPROM it doesn't connect to anywhere that it should. Pin 7 doesn't connect to the CPU but connects to everywhere else. And you can see pin 5 doesn't go anywhere. Uh, pin 3 doesn't go anywhere. And then pin 2 goes everywhere apart from pin 3 on here. So we know we have a number of bad tracks on this one. The original one I went to, the one with the modification. I then had a look at the third one, the bad one, and all the tracks on this measured the same as the good one. So this one does not have any bad tracks on it. So that means now we can do a couple of things. The easy one is going to be to look at the bad one, or say the easy one. So I'm going to look at first, yeah? I'm going to look at the bad one first. I know all the tracks are okay. So I'm now going to measure from all the pins on the EEPROM to ground, as I did before, without the EEPROM fitted, and see if I can see any difference. So if I see any difference on any of the pins, I know where they're connecting to here. Yeah, and it probably tells me I've got some bad chips here. So that's what I intend to do on that. So I'll get on with that now, comparing with the good one. And this shouldn't take me long at all now, so I can just literally go across all the chips on here and do the same on the other one. I mean, that Hunter on Tracker thing would have been handy here, actually. I could use that because it switches between testing two boards at once, but it's not difficult. In fact, I think the easy way to do this is going to be to strap the two grounds together and just go backwards and forwards between the two, actually. I've just spotted a, a, a bent pin here, by the way, if you can see it. Just uh, straighten that up as well. Okay. That's on the good board. Right, let's just connect these two grounds together and see how quickly we can go through these. Okay, so you can see we've got ground on both, yeah. Um, right, let's just go. So we just... We can just effectively put this where you can see it a little bit. We want diode mode. Yeah. 
put it where you can see it and where I can work. How about that? <laughs> I've got it in the end. Okay, I, I know the camera goes a little bit blurred at this side. I can't do much about that. I'll try. I think that's a reasonable focus. Okay, so let's just go across. So we can just take a reading. Well, straight away, we can see on pin one, we have a difference, yeah? Even though both these track out the same, we have a difference. Yeah. Two. Different. I'll make a note of the ones which are different, and maybe they all go to the same, you know, all these go to one chip. That might tell us something, yeah. Three. Shall we start again? Okay, well, you've got the idea. Let's start again, yeah. So, um, make sure I have a good ground onto both, yes. Yep, okay, let's go. One. I mean, little differences like that, they may have some effect. See that one there? Right, so they're not reading exactly the same at all. Certainly on the first three pins they're not. Can I get a good ground? No, no, I've got a good ground. Pin three. Okay. So the first three pins don't read, especially pin three, reading the same. Yeah, let's keep going. Yeah, you see there's differences here, yeah? Yeah, one's effectively detecting like a diode junction, the other one isn't. Yeah. It might be that it's just a very similar voltage and that just sees it, you know, there's a difference between a diode junction and not. Uh, seven, six, seven, seven, five, eight, seven, two, nine, seven, four, two. Uh, these are all reading the same. That one reads open. Reads open. <coughs> ground, ground, open. Not good ground there. Yeah, ground, ground, open. Let's go to the other side. Open, four, two, five, ground. Open, four, three, two, five, eight, ground. Ground, open, ground, open, ground. Reads, ah, that is a diode reading there, yeah, on the fifth one up. One, two, three, four, five. That reads open. Okay, so something, I found a real difference there, yeah? On the fifth pin up. So that's uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, pin 19. And that's on the bad board. Make a note of pin 19. Okay. Keep going. That one. Hit two six. Yeah. Top end ones. Okay, so there's at least a very big difference on pin 19, that's for sure. Um, interestingly, that was one of tractors didn't seem to go to anywhere, but this is reading like a diode junction on the bad one, which is interesting. Uh, these first three, especially pin three, didn't seem to read as I either would expect it to do. 
Which is making me think with this one. I mean, we, we have some different jumper settings. I suppose there's only one difference, which is that one, pin 8. I could just check again on the pins that we're reading differently. So, in particular, pin 8. Junction. Yeah. It reads similar, but just doesn't bleep, that's all. Okay. Pin 19. Sorry, I think I was actually... 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, the difference there, definitely. It wasn't pin 8. Pin 8's down this side. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Dilute junction. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Dilute junction. I have a couple of thoughts in mind now with these two then. One is that... It might be worth me changing all these because they're cheap. Yeah, just change all of these because they are interfacing between the CPU and the EEPROM. There's nothing else. Oh, and this little uh, 7406 or whatever it is over here as well. Might as well. Um, I could see if I can see any difference around the CPU. That might be interesting to have. I'll, I'll check that. So I'll go in diode mode around both CPUs so if there's any particular difference there. But if I do see a difference, really, I, I'd have to say I'm down to these chips again because that's where it goes to for the main port. The EEPROMs are not in, yeah? I had a look around the CPU. Again, I get this sort of thing where on one it reads like a diode junction, the other one it reads like a reading you know, maybe 0 0.725, 0 0.765. But I'm not sure if it's just the fact that this meter bleeps at a certain threshold and there's just a slight difference in the reading. So I can't find anything obvious like a shorted output or an open output. Because the the microcontrollers are programmed and they're protected, so I can't read them and program a new one. There's nothing I can really do about them. If it's faulty, it's faulty, yeah. But what I can do is finish off proving everything else. So, this bad one, all I can really do next is to take it back and fit the EEPROM off the good one. Does it work? Yeah. I can also try both or all three of the EEPROMs and the good one. Can I determine if I have two faulty EEPROMs? If that's the case, then I have one good one it's whether i can find some way to read it i don't recognize the part number of that eprom hopefully some of you guys can actually tell me what that is i've tried the other two in my eprom reader and it's slightly reading the same value from every location or maybe the same value from the first couple of rows or so and a different value from all the rest so i really don't want to put the good eprom in the eprom programmer in case i damage it because i haven't got a replacement i've got no way to replace that the only thing i can do is find the part number figure out how to read it safely read it and then program some new ones if i can get the correct parts okay so those two are going to go back that's the good one and the bad one. And we're going to try the different EEPROMs in each to see what we can prove there. Now, the other one, the original one, this obviously has some broken tracks on it. So, with this one, let's fix all the broken tracks and then let's do the same. Take all three back and try all three with the good EEPROM. Try the bad EEPROMs and the good one, yeah, that sort of thing. And then we should know what we have. So let's have a look at these faulty tracks and I'll just try and put this where you can actually see it. On the good one then, pin 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, should go to pin 5 on the uh, CPU. And it does. So this is the good one, yeah, pin 5 there. It goes to pin 2 on this one. It goes to pin 12 on this one which is here, yeah, pin 12, it goes to pin 19 on this one, okay, it goes to pin 12 on this one, you see how useful this is, and it goes to pin 9 on this one, 
Okay, so that's the good one. Let's look at the bad one and see if we can figure out where the broken track is. This is, let's say bad, this is the original one, I'll do that. So, same thing. Pin eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Pin eight. Doesn't connect to pin two. Doesn't go to anywhere, basically. Okay. So that doesn't go anywhere. So let's then come back from pin two on here, yeah? Let's see if this is going anywhere. So pin two. No. Well, this doesn't seem to connect at all. No. Let's go to the next one. So it should go to pin 12 on this one. Does this connect to the other ones? 19. Yeah. Should we go to pin 12 on this one? No. We should go to pin 9 on this one? No. And there, pin 5. No. Okay. So that just seems to connect from pin 12 on this one to pin 19 on this one. But that much we have, yeah. I can see where the track goes now. So that goes from 19 to 5. Yeah, I can actually see it on the board. So that track is bad. And that also comes across to the EPROM. I can see it now. Let's zoom it down a bit so you can see it. Okay, so 19 of here, you can see, should go to 5 of this one. There's no connections. This is, this is bad, yeah. That's how it comes down to pin 2 on this one. There's no connection. It's bad. Meter secured. So we have a... This track seems to be completely rotted away, basically. This should go to 90 on here. It doesn't. And it should go to pin 9 on here. And it doesn't. So in this, I'm going to have to replace this track, basically. There's the bridge wires along. So that's all of them missing. Uh, the other one, just as an example, and then we'll, we'll check them all. So pin 7 on here. Okay, you can see it's missing from pin 4 on the CPU, but it goes to all the others. Let's have a look. So this probably is a simple one to repair. So, pin 7. On here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Comes to... Doesn't go to the CPU, yeah, it doesn't go to the CPU. But it does go pin 3 on this one. Yeah. Pin 3 on this one, and it goes through all the other various pins it should go to as well. So this will be easy to fix. Uh, pin 3 on this one is 13. Yeah. On this one is 18. Yeah. This one is 13. And this one is 8. Yeah. So I can go through and I can check all the tracks like so and i can put bits of wire into bridge over the faulty track so i'll do that off camera so it'll take me a little while but using this map we've built in built up i can easily replace all these bad connections and then once again we can try with the various three eproms we have and see what we have working there you can see I've started to repair this, I've done this one. This is where I just had this one track broken, all the rest were okay. I'm now working on one of the ones where nothing seems to be connected. I think out of the uh, one, two, three, four, five, out of the seven, sorry, out of the six chips that should be connected together, only two of them are. That's actually this one. Now you can see I've been cleaning away here. And this is really bad, this track. There's, there's breaks in it here, there's another break in it somewhere here. So if I take the uh, continuity meter, which you will hear it bleep, and we go from pin 7 on the chip, which is here, which should go to pin 3 on the EEPROM, which actually was also here. And you see I have no connection. If I come far enough back, eventually I will have a connection. Sorry, that is pin 7, sorry, wrong one. Pin 7, so it's okay to there. And then it's gone, yeah. So I'll, replay, I'll repair this track. And it looks like actually quite a few of these. If we just scrape at them a little bit with the end of the uh, probe, you'll see what we have. So it's effectively, it's like, it's like rust, yeah. You can see the rust in them coming out of it. 
So this is the cause of a lot of the problems. So I'll repair this section, then go through and check again, see what's connecting to what, yeah. But you can see these have completely corroded. We can be fairly sure now what's happened is that water's got in the end of this machine one way or another, yeah. And that's why we have so many bad connections. I've now replaced all the broken connections, basically. So a lot of the tracks are very badly corroded, like you can see. This is not actually copper wire, it's enameled wire. I just stripped it from an old inductor. But this is insulating, so it won't conduct if it's touching anything. I will put a few little bits of glue on to hold it all down if it works, but for now I want to test it. I was trying to use this sort of wire, but as soon as I touched it with a soldering iron, it was melting the sleeving back, it was multi-strand, little strands were sticking where they shouldn't, and I found this much easier to use. So with this, you just get your soldering iron very hot and touch the end with a blob of solder, and it effectively melts the bit of enamel on the end and then you can solder it so for example here you can fold it double where you want to connect two wires to one pin it's actually one piece of wire just bent sharply there yeah i've checked again all the all the connections the ones were good so this actually reads okay what i want to do now is take this one and the other two back on site I want to test all of the EEPROMs in the good one. I'll also test this one as well with a known good EEPROM. I want to figure out now how many good EEPROMs I actually have. There are two more faulty boards there I can bring back here, which have different faults again. It could be a similar sort of thing to this. If it turns out I've got another board that I can't fix for reasons such as like a faulty processor and this one is good what i may well do in the end is take the parts off here and put them onto the other pcb if the pcb is good because i suspect some of these other tracks which have slightly damaged they're okay now but they might not stay okay yeah so if it turns out that i have another one i can fix it by changing the processor i will take the one off this to fix that one i think that's probably the most reliable the way to get the maximum number of boards but let's see if we can get five out of five we'll know a lot better once we know how many good e problems we've got and then we can figure out if we need to can we actually copy the good one and make some more good ones okay i hope you enjoyed that repair anyway a little bit of a different sort of work you can see that that sort of methodical tracking everything through, yes, it takes some time, but once you've done it, you can then whiz around the board. You've got a little chart, you know exactly what's connected to what, and it's very easy to start checking all of them in that way. Yeah. So I guess you'll see a part three of this lot in the next week or so when I know what's happening with the EEPROMs and I may have some more of the boards here. Okay, hope you enjoyed that one anyway, and I'll see you all soon on another Learning Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now, guys.